Okay, so thank you, Paul, for the invitation. Thank you for the uh, Institute for hosting me. This is my first dialogue, and I've enjoyed uh, every minute of it. Uh, I want to talk uh, today about the urban and the place of the urban and urban citizens in uh, conservation in, in the Anthropocene. As we know, we live in an increasingly urbanized world. More than half of the people in the world live in cities, and it's predicted that these trends will only increase into the future. So by 2050, it's expected that 64% of people living in the developing world will live in cities, and 86% of those in the, in the developed world, uh, these places will be urbanized. So cities will continue to be centers of power, and the urban is really where a democratic politics of conservation for the Anthropocene needs to start. This is where people will be. This is where we have to engage with people uh, to think about conservation. So for some uh, thinkers, this urbanization is, is good news for conservation. So abandoned land in rural areas creates spaces for nature out there in the countryside. It, it opens new opportunities for conservation territories. It potentially creates space for rewilding. Urbanization also permits the decoupling of society from environmental damage by reducing inefficient traditional activities, enabling agricultural intensification and resource substitution. So there's a story in which urbanization is a positive thing. However, this sort of work has less to say about the ecologies of cities themselves and the everyday lives of urban residents. When these are discussed, we're told that urbanization can also lead to both increases in infectious disease and pollution and to a pathological disconnection from nature. People have fewer educational encounters with wildlife, they develop little working knowledge of the processes of food production, and they even have higher rates of allergy, autoimmune, and non-communicative diseases. So there's something of a paradox in the story here. We might want to make space for nature in the countryside by encouraging people to move to the city, but the urban emerges as a deeply unnatural place to live. This is not to romanticize rural life, but to identify a deep ambivalence about the urban in some strands of contemporary urban theory. Now, I want to uh, argue that this is only really a paradox if we hold to this kind of binary spatial imagination in which the world can be divided into clear urban and rural spaces. In reality, the urban has a much more varied geography. There are urban villages, parks and gardens, post-industrial urban wild spaces, there's also a wide range of ecological networks through which urban spaces are connected to their rural hinterlands. And finally, a great deal of urbanization is happening through low-density urban sprawl. So the urban and the rural are not so easily separated, it's clear to say. This more varied geography offers new ways of thinking about the place of the urban in conservation. It also allows us to think about encounters between people and wildlife in the city to give us some pointers towards a democratic model of conservation in which citizens have access to nature and a stake in how it's managed. Now, on the way over here, my, my flight was delayed uh, for a day, and, and I got talking to a very affluent couple on the flight from first class, and I, I was explaining to them why I was coming, and they said, I'm, I'm coming to, to California to talk about urban conservation, and they looked at me blankly, and um, I said, it's urban green spaces, and, and the husband went, ah, golf courses. You're going to talk about <laughs> golf courses. Um, <laughs> Uh, now, I'm not interested in golf courses, and I'm not particularly interested in, in, in private parks either. I mean, and what I want to do is just to reflect on three possible types of urban ecology that we might start with if we want to think about a democratic politics for conservation in the Anthropocene. So the first, perhaps the obvious place to start, is with municipal parks um, like Central Park, Golden Gate Park here in San Francisco. And many of these were created by political pressure, by social reformers and public health advocates concerned about the mental and physical health of the industrial working classes, unable to reconnect to nature through tourist trips to the countryside. Parks are often now found in much more affluent parts of the city, and they're absent from many fast urbanizing cities in the global south, but there is a history in which some parks were explicitly built to create recreational spaces for the urban poor. Okay, so that would be the first example. A second example might be look, to look at uh, community gardens, or what we call allotments uh, in the UK. Uh, at least which in the UK are land set aside or reclaimed from urban development and allocated to local residents to, to grow food. Now, they're not enough for everyone, uh, nor do they enable some kind of you know, utopian urban self-sufficiency, uh, but they make it possible for often marginal citizens to grow food, to gather in public spaces, and to maintain a productive connection to the environment. Okay, so that would be the second example. And then the third example is a much less celebrated set of places, 
uh, which the British naturalist Richard Maybe terms the unofficial countryside. These are the scruffy bits of land around the edges or amidst the infrastructure of cities. These are feral spaces that are often outside of private or state control. They're ruins, if you like. They comprise an urban commons and have important democratic potential. So on the one hand, they're often places of transgression and illegal activity. These are locations of informal settlements and, and of homelessness. They might be toxic, they might be highly polluted, but they're also places where many young people have their first encounters with nature. So certainly me, growing up in London in the 1980s, uh, during a period of economic decline, most of my first encounters with nature were in sort of scruffy urban bits that had been abandoned and left feral, uh, and there were places in which my brother and I could go out and you know, encounter nature, if you like. So these are sites also for exploration and discovery. Okay, so just to tie this together, what I'm trying to argue is that urban spaces certainly have their problems. The urban is not necessarily a space lost to nature, uh, nor will urbanization inevitably lead to human disconnection from the environment. So humans, plants, and animals can thrive in certain geographical arrangements within the city. But really what we need to think about is how we might approach decoupling uh, without disconnection, if you like. How best to decouple society from damaging environmental processes without disconnecting people both ecologically and politically from the processes of living on a planet marked by human impacts. So I guess I'd say that the Anthropocene requires forms of conservation that recognize common claims to land and democratic models of land management. Thank you.